This is going to be great, guys. All right, y'all. I am very excited this week to host Jason Pantana for a business planning webinar. And this is going to be a little bit different than probably a business planning webinar that you've been on before. Jason and I kind of went over the plan for today, and I'm really excited to kind of dig into a lot of ideas. And I think that the idea for today is for you to pick and choose what resonates with you and what's going to work for your business in 2023. So he may say things that you have never heard before. He may say things you have heard before, but it's kind of the the picking and choosing. Uh, Jason is a business coach and speaker for Tom Ferry, uh, the number one coaching company here in the world. I was going to say here in the United States, but in the world. Um, And I'm fortunate to uh, have Jason yell at me on a weekly basis and give me anxiety through his coaching calls with lots of homework that I don't do. So- So uh, if y'all can drop in the chat where you are watching from, um, and we will make sure that Jason is capable of uh, sharing his screen because I didn't have the chat going earlier. So, all right. See my slides. He can share his screen. uh, So I will hand the, the floor over to him, but I'm seeing lots of places, San Antonio, Houston, Maine, Michigan, Dallas, Fort Hood, snowy Minnesota, all over. Um, Hmm. God, negative three degrees in, in South Dakota. That sounds terrible. Cape sounds great. Coral. Yeah. All right. The floor is yours, sir. Okay. So uh, a couple of just kind of housekeeping from my standpoint too. So this is going to be a different kind of presentation because it's not really meant to be a presentation. It's more of like a workshop. So Katie, please jump into the conversation. Uh, Katie and I are going to kind of like back, go back and forth on some of the ideas and content. And I want to echo what she said and I'll echo it again which is I want to sort of create an environment of ideas where you feel empowered to be able to say, Ooh, I love that idea. I hate that idea. I would never do that. I would definitely do that. What is that? And you can kind of gather this almost like it's a buffet and say, this is what's going to be a part of my plan. I'm going to give you a really simple framework and hopefully sort of leave you in a position of where you go to work on your business plan. So Katie, don't forget to like interrupt me and stuff. I'm going to share my screen, but I wanna make sure we're working together on this a little bit too. Uh, If we're not connected on social media, I would love to be a resource for you. Uh, I'm Jason Pantana, I'm on uh, LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Facebook, wherever you are, I try to have a presence there also. And if we say something where it's like, I don't know about that, or you wanna say, what about this? Just shoot me a DM, I wanna be a resource for you. And then we'll also try to make sure that we've got some time built in, Katie, for us to do, some Q and A and stuff like that, right? For sure. Q&A? Yep. Okay, great. Yep. Uh, and then as Katie mentioned, uh, I have had the privilege for the past seven years of working with the number one coaching program in the world of real estate, uh, Tom Ferry. And I know there's probably a lot of Tom Ferry folks on the session today and that's exciting. Uh, and the reason I always like to show this slide is because the stuff we talk about, where we're pulling our ideas from is actually coming from our ecosystem of, of rock stars like Katie and others who are on this session today who are implementing at a high level in their businesses. And and granted, nobody's doing everything. Like nobody's doing everything we're talking about today, but there are many of you doing a lot of the things. And I want you looking through the lens of, hey, what's gonna get my business from here to there next year? What's that gonna be, what's gonna be the thing or the tactic or the idea or the strategy that gives me a little bit more oomph and a little bit more push to achieve my goals next year? Because the market is obviously adjusting. Uh, things are changing. I think like we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the fact that, you know, with interest rates and listing supply and the media and all the things going on with real estate, uh, it's going to be a different market next year. It's going to be a normal market. And to me, change creates chances. So look at all the things that you might make a part of your plan to say, how does this enable me to go after a market share that was otherwise claimed over the past year? How do I take my business to the next level and seize the opportunity of change going on right now? Because the simple fact is, There are more agents than ever before in our marketplace and there are projected fewer sales next year. It's not gonna be a collapse, it's not gonna be a crash, but it will be a squeeze. And so my my advice is that right now, between now and the end of the year especially, you are ambitiously and with hustle going after filling your pipeline with leads, prospects, hand raisers, contacts, being in relationship with your database and really getting yourself geared up for just an absolute stellar 2023. Um, so just kind of getting into the framework today, just a little bit. And again, Katie, we talked about this. I don't want to go on presenter mode. So if you want to chime in, you just chime in at any point in time. I will chime. Uh, just, you'll, you'll chime in at I'll any chime. point. Perfect. <laughs> that was a good chime. I yeah. loved it. It was great. 
Uh, this is sort of the way I'm looking at business planning. I don't really call it business planning. I call it battle planning, uh, whereby you're the general of your business. And it's almost like you're staring over the map, the terrain of where the battles to go down. And you're like, there's my artillery. There's my archers. Here's my sneak attack from the woods. And you're kind of looking at all the pieces on the board of sales and marketing that are going to be what constitutes your business plan. Essentially, how am I going to get from here to there? How am I going to bring about the outcome? And so the way this is designed is that you are the general. I think he lost in this show. You're not that general. You're the one who won, but you're the general who is taking all the pieces. And you're saying this is or is not part of my plan based upon my marketplace, based upon my area, based upon what I'm trying to achieve. So again, today's a whole bunch of ideas and a way to think about how you plan. It's not the plan. You have to make the plan. Katie, would you add anything to that? I, I would agree with what you said. I don't have anything to add. Sorry. Okay. But I will okay. chime in. I promise to chime. Hey, I'll, so, I'll take the affirmation. Thank you're you. You're great, Jason. Good job. Oh, I needed that. Thank you. All right. Uh, I want to talk about three things as part of our battle planning. This is sort of the line of logic, the way I look at business planning. You're going to find there's a lot of business plans out there that I love, and they'll dig into motivation. They'll talk about your why, your mission, your values, your beliefs. And those are all wonderful things just not what I'm gonna to cover today. Uh, I wanna look at this through a very objective lens today. And there's three things we're gonna talk about. Uh, your goals is the first thing. Um, then we'll talk about sources and then we'll talk about channels. So kind of steal those in your brain for a second. Goals, sources, channels, and they build off of each other. I like to start with goals because of what Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. Um, to me, a goal is something that is quantitative. So I'm looking for a goal that's like this many units, this much GCI, this much net GCI or adjusted GCI, whatever. Um, I wanna save up this much money for a down payment for my first house or my first investment. I'm looking for something that is quantitative because I want you to sink your teeth into it. And I wanna be able to reverse engineer what is the pathway that leads us to that goal. So again, our plan is we have to have the goals, begin with the end in mind so that we can work backwards. Okay, well, if I wanna sell a hundred homes next year, what are my lead sources? Where are the deals going to come from that produce the hundred sales I'm going to get next year? So what you do in this section is you would basically say, well, what have I done before? Where have I historically gotten deals from? So we just go through a simple exercise of lead sourcing. I'm not going to do that here today. I'm sort of saying, hey, you should do some research on if you're new to the business, that's one thing. But if you're not new and you've done this before, analyze <clears throat> this year, last year, the year before that, what were the sources of business for me? Where did I get deals from? Repeat business, referral business, leads that converted. Where did I get deals? And what does that add up to? Does it achieve and equal up to your numeric goal? Katie, does that make sense so far? That does make sense. So if you guys know what your number one lead source is, drop that in the chat. Whether yeah. that is YouTube, expired, cold calls, Facebook, Instagram, agent referrals, FISBO, Instagram, YouTube, SOI, SOI, agent referral. Cool. Yeah, Appreciate sweet. That. So they're getting the hang of it. Now there's a difference between lead sources and channels. Sales and marketing channels are the third layer. So it's kind of like three layers. Like if this is an outline, it's Roman numeral one, goals. Big letter A, source. Big letter B, another source. But underneath each of your sources are the sales and sales and marketing channels that you'll utilize to work that lead source. It's like, how am I gonna, I don't know, shake the coconut tree so coconuts fall down kind of a thing? How do I actually make the lead source produce? what I'm looking for. And it's gonna be a combination of sales and marketing activities. So we're gonna call those channels or communication channels. So we begin with the end of mind. I'm just hoping that you're getting the framework right now. This isn't really training. It's more of just me sort of sharing what are my thoughts about how you should look at setting a plan. Begin with the end of mind. What are the goals? And then distinguish the difference between sources and channels. Because I see a lot of agents conflate these things where they'll act like a channel as a source and vice versa. But a source is actually like, hey, maybe I use Instagram to work my database of past clients in Sphere. But the deal came as a referral from my database of past clients in Sphere. So therefore, in that hypothetical scenario, the lead source is actually my past client Sphere. That's the audience that gave me the business. And I used Instagram as a channel for communicating with that lead source. Katie, did that make sense? That does make sense, yes. But then again, Instagram could also be a lead source, right? Because we could also generate business from it. So you have to kind of understand, well, how does this fit into my equation? Is this the hammer or the nail? Which one is it? How does it just depends on what you're trying to achieve? So I've got a list of 
lead sources. And what I thought might be useful for us just kind of together, Katie, is to just walk through this. This is not a definitive comprehensive list of every single lead source known to real estate agents across the world. It's just 12 of the big ones just to sort of stir up ideas. Where are you going to get your business from in 2023? And what I would do is I would jot down the ones where you're like, I want to make that part of my plan. Yeah. Or, oh, I already do that. That is part of my plan. So the first one on the list is past client sphere of influence. Katie, weren't there a bunch of people in the chat who said that's already their number one source? Yeah, seeing a ton of past client sphere of inf influence and referrals from those. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, so, and by the way, before I go too far, I should also mention, I've got a link at the end of the presentation to download all the slides. So the slides are sort of like a document that you can then reference when you go to make your plan. So just, you'll get all my slides as soon as we're done. I'm just going to not give them to you now because you'll go download them and won't be here with us <laughs> together. Um, but I, got, I have marked repeat and referral business because that's what a database yeah. is. I call this the referral coefficient. You might have a database, past client sphere of influence database of, I don't know, 500 people. But the coefficient of how many people they could connect you to in terms of referrals is an unknown number. It represents tremendous opportunity. If you look at NAR data, uh, I'll go slides off for a second. If you look at NAR's data, Katie, last year, or actually this year, excuse me, this year, NAR says that 63% of sellers found their agent because of repeat or referral business. 50% uh, of buyers, it was repeat referral. Yeah. Now, not, not to go too tangential, but um, last year, 2021, it was 68% of sellers and 60% of buyers. So, exactly. so we actually saw a pretty significant drop over the past year which is relatively easily explained. It was a it was an odd drop. But interestingly enough, on the buy side, the 10% loss was gained by two other sources of business. It was yard signs and direct property inquiries. Those two went up proportionate to what referrals went down, essentially, which I think is probably the first half of the year where folks couldn't get their houses. And so they went, they just started driving around, finding properties and calling the agent. And the agent was like, I'm going to double in this deal. Yeah. And so that's how they found their agent. I don't know if you have a different perspective or not. Maybe people weren't calling their past clients in sphere or doing things to, you know, follow up with them. So, I mean, I mean, maybe so. Part of it. I mean, maybe so. I think a lot of times agents, I, I'm all about having leads and diversifying your lead generation. But if you are neglecting working the community around you existing, your database of past clients and sphere, you're actually overlooking roughly two thirds of your business. Statistically speaking, it will be about two thirds of your business yeah. if you work it properly. So what's the game plan to work it properly? I see the chat coming in, but it's, I'm looking at a teleprompter. So all the words no. are back. Yeah, to me. you're all good. <laughs> uh, Lisa saying that she did close some deals over this past year for people calling on signs. So she was one that got to take advantage of people calling her sign calls. It was, it was, it's a, been a thing. So actually y'all should look at the um, National Association of Realtors releases their annual report, the profile, profile of home buyers and sellers. And it's got, it's, there's always interesting learnings. I've got like the last 12 years and I just keep a spreadsheet and I log in the data so I can see the yeah. trends. I have my own spreadsheet just to see what's going on. Um, but I'll tell you what, the big the big news, and this is unrelated to our talk today, but <laughs> and first time home buyers obviously got hit hard. I believe the data was, we had the smallest showing of first time home buyers in the history of the report because of prices and affordability. So there's a lot of change going on, but again, change creates chances. But beyond chances, your database, it's just, it's a, it's a low hanging fruit, obvious opportunity in terms of where you should get your business from. So that's the first one is past client sphere of influence. Uh, I'm going to pick up my pace a little bit. Maybe it's agent, agent referrals. Katie, I think you know a thing or two about that, right? Yep. Yep. Agent, agent referrals. Great to, you know, lean in on coaching communities and real estate events and stuff like that to meet other agents from across the country. Yeah. Yeah. And I think about like uh, Ken Pozak, for instance. I always remember his story because I know that he relocated marketplaces. He moved halfway across the country, um, had an ex established business, and then essentially was able to match what he had done the year before in his old market in the new market. And he would tell you half of it was he prospected his face off, expires and things like that yeah. and open houses. But the other half was he had a really great agent community. And so he knew how to work his agent to agent network to generate referrals. And he was, he had moved to a marketplace that actually had more referrals to give him, which is Orlando. 
And so it's also nice to be in a marketplace where people are moving to and it's transient in that respect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Texas doesn't have anybody moving to it though, right, Katie? Not, not many people, no, yeah. No, nobody goes to Texas. <laughs> All right, so your agent to agent referral community. Uh, geographic farm. I've been using an expression, I call it adopt a farm, kind of like adopt a highway sort of a thing. But right now, because the market is adjusting, we're seeing agents, they're, they're stopping certain marketing activities, they're cost cutting because they think it's going to help protect them and sustain them um, in a famine like situation. A, I don't think we're gonna have a famine. I think we're, we're going to see a squeeze in the marketplace, but not a famine in terms of no deals. But the areas I see agents cutting the most, I've seen agents cutting their spend in terms of how they promote listings. I'll cover that later. I've seen them drop like zip codes if they're buying leads from a portal or something like that, they've dropped those or reduced their budgets. They stop spending money on PPC advertising. So that's your cost per lead on Google and Facebook is actually cheaper. In a world of inflation, there are certain advertising outlets that cost less right now. Um, I'm seeing folks get, I'll get the portal leads in a second, but we're negotiating better deals on zip codes because they're not delivering as many leads as they promised. And so it's kind of like when your Comcast internet isn't working very well, that's when you call them to try to get a better deal. And so we're starting to see some better deals pop up. Kita, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but GeoFarm, I'm seeing a lot of agents just, we can't afford to send postcards right now. We yeah. can't afford to do our annual event. We can't afford to do our marketing. And I'm sort of like step aside and go take their spot and start looking for farms to adopt and investing in building a brand. It's kind of like, when do you buy stocks in an up or a down market? And the answer is well, on a down market because I'm actually getting stocks for less than they should be, and they will rebound and they'll be worth more money, but it's gonna be rebounding at an exponential compounding rate because I bought a lot of them. Yeah. That, so they all go up individually. Anyways, that kind of math I find exciting, but geographic farm, that's an opportunity in your marketing. Uh, open houses, this is, a, this is a source of free leads. I don't know why agents aren't like hell bent on blitzing open houses all the time. I hear, oh, nobody came. Well, you didn't promote it well. What I like about open houses is, is they're worth more than just the people who sign in on the sign-in sheet. If you're using branded directional signs, if you're letting your database know you're hosting open houses, if you're using the open house event as something to promote, if you're door knocking the neighbors, if you're working that area, open houses are a tremendous source of business. Uh, we did a case study at Summit, or Tom did, where we went through and documented what one of our teams does with open houses and they divide and conquer the whole team has like multiple open houses in their marketplace with directional signs everywhere. You would think they had a million listings in that area and they use like Spacio. So they have all everybody signs in and they'll generate like 300 leads a month off of doing open houses every weekend. So I would just say like open houses are one of those hustle pillars as Phil Curtis likes to call them <laughs> that I don't think you can really escape. They're just, I got my first ever deal from an open house. I'm a major believer in open houses. I know Katie loves open houses. I Hi, do. It's free. And one yeah. thing I'd like to point out is he says, if you, if you, if you, as far as putting out signs, as far as door knocking in the neighbors, as far as all of these things, that's not an if, it's a when. So Touché. I always hear agents complain and say, you know, hey, no one came to the open house. I'm like, well, how many signs did you put out? And they're like, four. Well, well that's, how many yeah, doors exactly. did you have? none, right? So those are all the things that you should be doing to prep for it. And that may not mean business today, but you leaving a flyer, you leaving a business card, you talking to neighbors is that brand equity that's going to carry you in 20, uh, 2023 next year. Yeah. I think that's, um, yeah. Spacio is the app S P A C I O Spacio. Um, and again, if you guys have questions, please drop them into the Q and a yeah. we'll answer some of the, the smaller ones as we, as we move through, but then we'll, if Jason gets through his slides, we'll, uh, <laughs> No, no, not we'll if I, it, it's when I get through my slides. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So open, again, all I'm doing here is just laying out options. I just want to create like, you're the general, you're looking over the table. It's your battle formation. What's going to be on the table as part of your mix for business and so forth. Um, industry partners. Hey, are y'all, are y'all working your lender list? Are you working with attorneys? What about title? Are you working your relationships in the industry to generate business? Usually that's a backwards relationship where they expect agents to give them business and they're really, really good at working us for business, but it should be the other way around too. So I would just ask you, uh, well, actually I would say this could go through two lenses. Some of you already have these relationships and maybe it's time for some marketing spend and you should be getting a marketing budget to offset some of your costs. Like for example, the cost of promoting an open house, take that to the lender. 
and say like, hey, we'd like to be able to provide, I don't know, tacos at the open house or something like that. Do you have a marketing budget that we can tap into? And there's a way to work that out. Obviously, make sure you're careful with RESPA and all that kind of stuff. But you need to work your industry partner network for more business. That's a source of business. One thing uh, too, before, before, before you move on, one thing too, on the lenders, lenders right now, because refi business is effectively completely gone at this point, are I, hungry for business, right? And so we have lenders that are reaching out to us on a daily basis, asking to meet for coffee, asking to go to lunch, asking to do these things. If they're asking you for business, my response is always, hey, I would love to see how you work and I would love to work with you. If you have a pre-approved buyer you can send to me, I would love to work with you. Right. Good so that's something, you know, to bring that business back to me because every lender wants to go have coffee, but we have our preferred lenders that we work with on a regular basis. Also, if you're dropping stuff in the chat, see where it says hosts and panelists, click on that and change that over to everyone. Cause a lot of y'all's chats are just coming to Jason and I, and not everyone in the group. So unless you want to talk to just to Jason and I, that's cool, but all you guys are dropping some nuggets that everyone should see. So totally speaking of, I'm going to just look at the chat. All right, there we go. <laughs> I don't like, there it goes. This new feature with Zoom, it's difficult. Whatever. It's, you know, you just need to learn how to read backwards just, um, and we can move on to portal leads. Let's I go. I need to get a third monitor is what I need to go. Uh, portal leads. So Zillow, Realtor.com, that kind of stuff where you're buying leads. Um, my main point here is obviously manage your ROI. Most of these portals are not providing you the quota of leads they promised right now. Um, we've been successful in negotiating and getting a couple of good deals or buying in the new zip codes that other agents gave up. It's just, it's a lead source. I'm not, I'm not saying you should do it. I'm saying you should consider it. That's all. Uh, inbound social media. So this is like what Katie, Katie kills it at this, where she produces really great content. She's really built a community online. And so she's able to generate inbound leads from social media for the average agent. Social media is much more of a channel than it is a lead source. And I'll talk about that more later, but it can be if you do it long enough and consistently and you're reaching new people and they're following you and they're kind of falling in love with your thought leadership and subscribing to it, then eventually that can produce inbound social media opportunities. It can also produce agent agent referrals and then search inbound. So like Google search, this is really going to be a product of crushing your Google business profile, really dialing in your local or your profiles like Yelp and other profiles that have a lot of strong SEO qualities. It's going to be your website and blogging and things like that. Referral websites. This is low hanging fruit. So like if you go do, I don't know, just a Google search, like I might say best realtors, can't spell realtors, Houston, just like that. Let me zoom in a bit. Obviously these are local services ads and they're great, but look at these. Oh, she's smart. She's running an ad on that. They're both running ads on that. Wow, Houston's got some smart players. Usually these ads, I'll do a different market. I'll just do Baltimore. Upnest, My Agent Finder, Fast Expert, Home Light, Agent Pronto, Dwellful, uh, Dave Ramsey, Endorse Local Provider. Those types of platforms, they're running ads on this stuff. Some of those platforms will promise that you'll work for 1% or something like that. That's not what I'm advocating for. Some of these platforms charge you a monthly fee. You can decide that with your coach, if that's a good decision or not. But most all of these platforms will charge you a referral fee on any deals you get from it. My thought is that's the cost of doing business. If that's what it takes to get a new past client, I'll pay the referral fee because one of my clients, Katie, he did the analysis in his own marketplace of what's the average lifetime customer value of one of his customers for him. And it's 150 grand per customer. And so, I'm thinking, boy, if I can pay a 35, 30, 35% referral fee on one and then have them for life, it's worth it. And somebody else is going to get these. Yeah. I was talking with Ray Ellen. He just set up a bunch of these and he was like, I got four leads like the first day that just came through when he set these things up. So just if you haven't crossed this off your list, you oughta. It's just kind of like passive lead generation that you can just have there for yourself. Yeah. Uh, Fizbo's and expireds. Anything to add, Katie? Um, no, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's the biggest thing is for those referral sites or those channel partners, um, you know, the portal leads that we we're talking about, you just have to go all in on them to generate those past client referrals, right? So that first deal may be at a lower commission percentage or have that referral fee on top of it. But if you go all in on them and they refer you one or two or three more people, that's the hundred K plus that Jason is talking about. Under, absolutely. Uh, Fizbo's and expires. Again, we're talking about free leads. They require a lot of hustle. Um, the expired one I'm, I'm very fascinated by. So I was talking to a coaching client this week 
And he said that in the past 30 days, he's had three customer like, random out of the blue phone calls from uh, sellers who are currently already on the market listed for sale. They're on the market and they called and said, we're really unhappy with how our agent is marketing our property. Remember I had said a second ago, like a lot of agents are backing down their marketing efforts and the timing is horrible. So he gets phone calls and they're like, so we looked up who's the best realtor in the area. Um, and he's ranking on his Google business profile. And so they read his reviews and then they look him up on Instagram and see if he looks legit or credible. And if he does, they call him. He's gotten three of those calls in the past 30 days and he took two listings. And then one, they got a low ball offer out of nowhere they accepted. Otherwise he would have had it. Yeah. And all of them said the same thing to him. Hey, our agent's really not working very hard for us. And it seems like you really put marketing first. So we'd like to talk to an agent like that. Does that make sense? 100%. And so he took the listings, but here is the thought I had after that little story. You've got to start, it's not just about working expired listings. You have to seed expired listings. Obviously you can't go around bad mouthing other agents as a violation of the code of ethics and it's just bad business. Don't do that. But you could start in your videos, for instance, start saying things like, you know, the other day I was working with um, a listing. It was actually a listing that had been on the market with a different agent who wasn't meeting the expectations of the seller. So I took it over and we noticed three things out of the gate that a lot of listings are missing when it comes to properly marketing themselves out of the gate. One, two, three, just something like that, hypothetically. But then what happens is, all your raving fan past clients who watch your videos will be like, ooh, Sharon needs to see this video. And so they'll message that video to their friend Sharon who's in the market with some other agent. And they'll start being your like fan club uh, street team yeah. that starts taking your videos where you never made a disparaging comment, but it's seeded the idea that there is, there is grass on the other side that may be greener in terms of working with the different agent. And it's in your videos. And I'll even tell you, we came up with a headline that I, I really liked. I think we talked about it this morning on our call, actually. We did. Didn't we, Katie? Yeah. We did. So I don't know if you liked it or not. But the headline is um, Your Home Deserves the Spotlight. And I imagine that as a headlight or as a headline on your website, it could be a postcard, it could be um, seated in your videos, it could be in your LinkedIn bio, it could be, I just turned on iTunes, go away. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Give me a lot of, I don't know what I hit. But I like the idea of, um, your home deserves the spotlight for several reasons. One, when you think about your language, and I know I'm on a tangent, but I'm gonna go with it anyways. Um, Phil Jones would say, don't say we, don't say our, don't say my, say you. So the fact that it's your home makes it about you, the customer. I like that out of the gate. Uh, I like the word deserves. If you've ever read uh, Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller, in that book, he talks about um, solving problems that a customer has in your marketing, but there's two types of problems. There are internal problems and there are external problems and internal problems are different. Like the external problem is, Hey, my home's not selling. I need an agent who's going to sell my home. Can you sell my home? Yeah, I sell homes. But the internal problem is you deserve that your home gets the spotlight. It appeals to this notion that how dare that agent cut their marketing spend? How dare that agent didn't go to bat in a more difficult market to, to ensure your property got the widest possible exposure. And so I just, I like that headline, your home deserves the spotlight and your postcards. So just take it, leave it, do what you want. I'm going to go back to my content, but that was a thought. Katie, back any to commentary? Planning. Back to business planning. Yeah. Um, if y'all have questions, please try to drop them in the Q and A so we can hit them at the end. I'm seeing a lot of them come through on the chat and they are going to get lost as we continue to go through this. Okay. All right. I'm going to pick up my pace. Landlords and renters, i.e. absentee, non-owner occupied, and renters could be audiences you go after. It could be a prospecting effort. It could be a marketing to them effort. We'll talk about that in a second. And then last is digital ads. So Google, Facebook, things like that. This is the giant list of just ideas for lead sources. We have goals and then we have sources of business that will produce the achievement of those goals. And then last, we'll talk about what are the sales and marketing communication channels that we can utilize to actually work the lead sources, to actually get the business from the lead sources? And I've got a big old list that we're going to go through. Again, I'm going to give you a link at the end for all the slides if this is useful to you. Um, there's two types of sales and marketing communication channels. There's one-to-one -one and there's one-to-many. So one-to-one -one is like calls and voicemails. I'm going to call you. I'm going to leave you a voicemail. It's me talking to you one at a time. So that's more of a sales activity. Then there's one to many. Like for example, I posted a video that was for anybody to see. I sent an email to my entire database. 
So think about it through the lens of there are sales channels, which are typically one to one, and there are marketing channels, which are typically one to many. Katie, does that need to be further expounded upon? No, I mean, that, that makes sense. Okay, sweet. All right. If there's questions, just drop it in the Q&A and I'll happily attempt to explain myself. So I want to be, I want to just cover the first three out of the gate here. So like first up calls and voicemails. If you choose a lead source, like your past clients in sphere, use this thing and call them. So just make it a part of your plan. What are my sales channels and my marketing channels that I'll utilize to work that lead source calls and voicemails, uh, text messages and MMS stands for multimedia messaging, which is like, uh, DMS on Instagram and stuff like that. Katie, you're doing some pretty cool stuff with DMS. I'm a huge fan of video DMs um, and video messages that's one-to-one -one text. So me picking up my phone and saying, hey, Jason, thanks so much for hopping on the webinar today. It was a great time. You're great. Yeah. Love the purple background. Talk to you Thank tomorrow. You. See you later, blah, 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 whatever. And sending that off, right? And doing yeah. that video message where it's direct to him and using his name so he knows it's not just something that I said, hey, hope you're having a great day, blah, 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 whatever. It's directly to him. Yeah. So leveraging... Multimedia, videos, audio messages, written messages, animated GIFs that are funny and obviously you sent them, things like just having fun with it. Even using like the, I forget what they call it, but the emphasis on when you like make your text message slam or have the ink effect or things like, just having, utilizing multimedia available to you. Um, knocks, drops, pickups, and pop buys. So like door knocking, uh, door drops, uh, pickups. For example, hey database, we're doing a coat drive this year. When's a good time that you're home that I could pick, I could stop by and pick up any coats you might want to donate to our charity? Things like that. Just pickups or pop buys. When's a good time I can pop by and drop off a Thanksgiving Day pie next week? What's going to be a part of your plan? That's the idea here. Oh, uh, I was even thinking of the pickups like they come to your office and pick up the pie or drop off the thing. That's fine right? too. I know a lot of people Actually, centralize that their stuff. That, that is actually what I meant when I wrote it. Ah, well. I, just, I just went a different way. So either way, we got the point across. We did. But yes, they could come to your office and pick up their pie. They could pick up their photos from the photo, whatever. They're not going to pick up their photos, but you get the gist. But it's also you could stop by to pick something up too, which is more of a pop by, but I feel like I'm losing the point here. I'm going to move on. Let's move on to emails. Let's move on to emails. <laughs> Uh, I've got the one to one versus one to many note down here just to remind you emails could be mass emails and they could also be like one to one emails sidebar and emails because uh, I just released an entire course as part of our marketing pro series on emails. Do you know the average professional sends about 40 emails a day in America, the average professional and did you know those emails that you send every single day have about a 100% open rate. Pretty good right compared to like mass emails. Some of you probably send 40 to 80 to 100 emails a day with 100% open rate. So if you're doing that like five days a week, for instance, you're sending 500 emails a week, theoretically, if you're doing 100 a day. Um, my point to you is you should really think about your email signature. Your email signature is actually being seen and the calls to action in it are equally as likely, if not more likely to be clicked than in your actual mass emails. So I would say don't overlook the opportunities to actually build in your marketing, whatever you're pushing or the things you're the outcomes you want. Join our team. Um, PS. Yeah. PS. My business is based upon referrals from great folks like you. If I can serve anybody, you know, it would be my, pl my pleasure. Just things like that. Maybe you don't have because you don't ask. And so I would put those into your calls to action and really make make a priority there. If you, guys have, if you have a call to action in your signature line, uh, would love to know what that is. Share it in the chat. Um, some, a couple of people have messaged me off Zoom. Um, I also want to know if you guys pronounce it GIF or GIF, just out of curiosity. So that's also another question I have, GIF or GIF. I know the right answer. Uh, I'm just wondering what people think. Uh, Jason, let's get back to your slide deck, please. No, no, I have to answer that question. <laughs> it's a GIF. Okay. You know how I know? How do you know? Jimmy Fallon did a special on it. Uh, <laughs> it was, it's a GIF, like the peanut butter. All right, let's I, get I back like to the slides. Yeah, like the peanut yeah. butter. Like peanut uh, butter. Uh, so this is an example of Matt Curtis's emails. Matt is sending out like three emails a week to a database of over 50,000 people. Um, he's killing it. His database consists of Sphere, past clients, leads he's generated. It's just a whole cornucopia of his database. And he sends them a weekly roundup. It's basically a newsletter that repurposes content he's publishing throughout the week. 
It's not fluff. It's not canned. It's actually his material and he's actually curating and sharing good information, but he's also known for these calls to action. So I would just say like, think about your email marketing. This isn't an email training per se, but your email, email is the number one ROI marketing channel in the history of marketing. I would tell you that I think video is the top marketing format, but the number one channel is email bar none. And so I would say like, have you really figured out how to effectively utilize email? I would also say with so much social media instability these days and changes going on, your email list really, really matters. Um, and don't be afraid like Matt sends out a call to action that's this direct every single Monday to his entire database. And because of that, he's generating about 24 to 25 inbound direct people reply to the email wanting to book a listing appointment. He does about 24 to 25 a quarter of that kind of a response. So I know you're generating leads. I also know that because the marketplace is adjusting, I know that the standard time cycle or the life cycle of a customer is resuming its normal stretches. So like during COVID, people's time frames got really wacky and like, oh, I'm gonna buy a house today. I decided it yesterday. And so all of a sudden they were in market. We're seeing folks go back to our more standard run of the mill types of time frames for when they think about buying or they think about selling to when they ultimately take action on that which means you gotta have a really strong nurture plan in mind. And I would say to you that email needs to be a major piece of that. What are you gonna do to be in front of that lead? Because we know when you generate leads, we know they're not ready the moment you generate them. So how will you over time as they mature and get more serious, how will you make sure that they're like, oh, you gotta work with Katie, she's the best. We love Katie because she gives us this, this and this and demonstrates her expertise and all those kinds of things. Uh, next thing on the list, social media. So like Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, wherever you're at, I've, I've got noted two sides of it. And Katie, I'll want your thoughts on this. Your content, um, I've said many times before that marketing without content is like a bow without arrows. That's video, it's your expertise, it's what you're presenting, but also are you building a community? Like that to me is kind of the two sides of the coin for social media. Am I sharing valuable content that I can utilize in all my other marketing endeavors? And am I building a community? Any thoughts? I don't know if you are um, intentional on where your arrows are coming from, but the arrow from the Facebook to the community reminds me of like the it Facebook was. groups. Yeah, the it Facebook was, groups actually. that you could do with your past clients to create that community, right? And have them join either when you start working with them or once they close or whatever that is to create that sense of community, to invite them to your events before you put them out to the public or whatever that may be. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's huge. I think that also DMing your clients and, and group DMs, group DMs too. I hate group DMs just personally. Don't do group me. DMs They're I meant they're the worst. <laughs> no, no, it is a good idea, but also, um, DMing your clients on social so that your content will show up more on their feeds. Right. So yeah. having those conversations with them, talking to them about what's happening in their lives, you know, is great for the catch up. Right. But then it's also great because then it pushes your content algorithmically into their feeds. Yeah. So we call it DM and comment priming. It's the same thing. Anything to which they can reply to on Instagram, for instance, is a algorithmic conversation. So like the platforms be like, Oh, they talk to each other. Let's show them each other's content. One of the best things you can do to get your content in the feeds of the people who are your past clients in sphere is to engage with their content yeah. because they'll likely reply to your DMS, reply to your comments, and that will seal the fate of your future post in their feeds. So smart move. All right. Uh, digital ads. So Google ads, Facebook ads, YouTube ads, all the digital ads. Uh, I would tell you that I think YouTube in stream ads, the commercials are massively underutilized. I think Google display network ads, those are the banner ads with the, like seeing your face all over the internet are massively underutilized. Um, I think uh, Google local services ads are a no brainer. Those are these ones. These are local services ads. They're a no brainer. Uh, if you wanna see what the, I can show you what the um, display network ads are. They'll pop up here in a second and I'll show you what they are. Uh, I would also say like running, with your Google business profile, hit the promote button and running ads there as well is also a smart, like just if Google has an ad product, I would seriously think about it. Um, see these ads here. These are all display network ads that Google puts on random websites. They're just massively, massively underutilized. And they're, I have a lot of trainings on my YouTube channel teaching you exactly how to do those, but they're, they're not that hard to do. And they're really great ways to kind of put your brand everywhere. And then also Facebook and Instagram. And I've been pushing a lot of my clients, Katie, to start taking their existing content on social that they posted organically and then targeting their database, 
targeting it to their local marketplace to really just kind of put a dome over top of their marketplace and saturate the Facebook feeds, Instagram feeds, and feeds of all their people with their content. So again, just going through ideas of what could be a part of your plan. Um, events, parties. Events. Yeah, go ahead, talk about them. No, I love events. We do uh, six client events per year. Um, we do happy hours, charity events, things like that. And it's just a great yep. opportunity to be able to reach out to your past clients, to your sphere, to people you know in your community to invite them to a party. It's a great, it's a great time. Yeah, so I think parties, happy hours, stuff like that. Open houses could be events for working at Geo Farm. So like you can see how an open house could be a lead source or a channel, depending upon the way you want to use utilize it. Educational events like investor networking groups or buyer seminars, seller seminars, webinars, things like that. There's just a lot of opportunity there. I just interviewed Dave Archuleta yesterday, who we both know, and we're gonna do a This Week in Marketing episode on his event strategy. So he runs like softball leagues and wine tasting clubs and things like that in his farm area. And he absolutely kills it. It will probably be out next week on Tom's YouTube channel. But like his event strategy to me is just, it's not for everybody, but for the people who can really relate to it, it's just a great event strategy. Well, and I mean, he's, he, I think he's going to sell like a hundred mil plus this year in like a three to five mile radius. Like that's how super yeah, hyper local he is. And he absolutely crushes. Dave is awesome. He, he is. And his events, when he started his little softball league, that little softball league alone in the first nine months generated 400 grand in GCI. Not bad. And, Not and when bad. you say little softball, like he thought it was just going to be like two teams or three teams. It's like, 15 teams it's it's a massive endeavor that he did yeah. not expect to happen well as it's, big as it's, it it's massive but it became a team like it became the the community like took it on for him yeah. he's not bearing a huge burden it's not easy but it's not hard either and it cost him nothing yeah because everybody else kind of chipped in and that's the way it works um online profiles so like your google business profile your yelp profile just googling yourself and seeing what's there and googling other agents and seeing what they've got there and making sure your profiles are super strong that's another channel for like this channel might belong to if you want to up your seo as far as a lead source is concerned uh sponsorships sponsoring teams festivals schools uh this one is i really do like this one it could be costly so like a lot of the really really big teams they'll sponsor like a professional sports team which is which is awesome if you can do, if you have the budget for it it's really really expensive but those sports teams or whatever oftentimes have really great seo and so i was talking to an agent who runs they do over three thousand sales a year and they're a sponsor of a national uh sports team and anyways the condition was that team has to link to his website in order for him to be their sponsor so they get a link from that website to his website which is called a backlink and because of that one link, his SEO, I could Google almost anything in his city and he's going to rank on the top of Google. I could Google any single property address of any listing for sale. And because his SEO is so strong, he'll rank either above or below Zillow on the first page of Google organically. It's crazy good. Not crazy bad. Good. Not bad. Yep. Hang on. I'm just seeing what Katie needs. She's texting me. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I got it. All right. Um, SEO and SEM, we already talked a little bit about that. Uh, signs, billboards, movie theaters, shopping carts, benches, posters, this could be cost prohibitive. Um, can I give a little hack to this one? Of course. So a couple of thoughts. If you're thinking about billboards, you can't think about one billboard. You have to think about how do I get enough billboards in an area where it's actually going to get someone's attention. You want to act like if one billboard doesn't do much, but if I had 50 billboards in a city, that really starts to get remembered. You always have to think about if you're going to do, take on a marketing channel, you have to ask yourself, am I just a drop in the bucket or am I actually going to make an impact and a dent and get some saturation in terms of being remembered and top of mind awareness in that marketplace? That's if you're doing Hulu ads or if you're doing YouTube ads or if you're doing billboards or whatever, you have to think about it's not the one, it's how do I get the dent in that available market? I don't know if that made sense, um, but billboards. Uh, you ought to look at a website like Lamar. They're the ones, uh, L-A-M-A-R. They do, they have a really cool website. One of the tricks I hear is that a lot of folks, they've got different types of billboards. You can do the cheapest options like the poster where they put the poster over top of the billboard. But the trick is you only pay for like 30 days. And then unless they can resell your billboard to somebody else, they'll just leave your poster up there indefinitely. And then if somebody else tries to buy your billboard, they'll let you know and you can renew it at that point in time. So you can potentially get some free exposure after that first month 
um, I gave one of my clients the idea of he should hire someone to drive around the city and look for faded billboards because a faded billboard specifically from competitors, because a faded billboard means that they're not paying for it right now. And so you can make a whole list and then try to buy up all the billboards of your competitor. Anyways, just, just a thought, but billboards are fascinating. Uh, movie theaters, uh, some of my clients, the far group out in Spokane, they've got like a little commercial. They run as Hulu and YouTube ads, and they actually run it as like a commercial before the movies play in their local movie theaters. It's another option, shopping carts, benches, posters, just signage is another opportunity, not a cheap one. Same with postage, uh, postcards, handwritten notes, letters, cards. There are really cool tools like audience.co that will do like handwriting machines and they can really, so you don't have to get like writer's cramp writing all your, all your postcards. They can help you write your postcards at scale. And the audience.co is a super cool tool, not a cheap one, but a super cool tool for anybody who wants to write handwritten notes, but they're geo farming. So think about that as like a tool for, or a channel for working a geographic farm source. Um, letters, maybe to absentee owners or renters or things like that, sending out like cards or letter stock, those types of opportunities. Uh, publications, maybe there's local trade publications or local papers, things like that, where you can run ads, or maybe you can be like a contributor or get mentioned in some way and get some press through that. Um, maybe there's just other outlets for getting press and PR. You can be a part of charities and just look for some PR opportunities to build your brand reputation locally. And then the last one on my list is TV and radio, which doesn't have to mean like traditional TV and radio. It could also mean like Hulu ads. It could mean like Amazon DSP, which is their demand side platform. They're running basically it's in stream ads during Amazon prime TVs, TV shows. They've got a whole platform where you can run ads there. Uh, you can do YouTube TV ads. There's just so many places you can market yourself. And so my hope in doing all this was, wow, I didn't know I could do that. Wow, I thought it was only this, but really there's all these other things I can do to make it like your brand under the dome of your marketplace. Because I think about marketing through the lens of, I wanna create massive brand awareness and I wanna generate leads. It's both. I get the question a lot, like what's the purpose of marketing? It's brand building and lead generation. What comes first? either one. You can either lead generate and then spend time branding and nurturing until they're ready to work with you, or you can brand and nurture and attract business. Either way, you're doing, you're doing marketing. So it boils down to what are your goals? What are the sources of business that will add up to the tally of those goals? What are the channels, communication channels, marketing, sales channels that are going to work the sources to get the goals? Because my thinking is you're either the agent of choice or you're an agent of chance and the odds don't favor an agent of chance. Um, one more thing before I take my slides off and give you the, the link, and then we'll do some Q and A. If you do want to know more about, uh, email marketing, social media marketing, or Google business profile marketing, I've got a link here to our new course series It's called marketing pro. These are on demand, like three hours per course trainings. Katie, I think you have your marketing manager working through these, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I think she's on Google business and maybe the email, but a lot right. of good takeaways. So yeah, they're. Right. they're so this is here for y'all. If you want to check it out and get a lot more training or maybe get your marketing manager a lot more training, you can click or scan this code. And I'm going to give you the slides here in just a second, which are on my website. So if you go to jasonpantana.com slash battle plan, you can get the slides from today. I'll leave the link up there for a second. But Katie, do you want to start jumping into Q&A? Yeah. So um, let's try to uh, go through these. If you guys put questions in the chat, please click on Q and a and drop them in here as well. So we can try to get to them in the next 10 minutes. How do you promote an open properly? I would say 20 plus yard signs. You're not at least 25 neighbors, um, sending it out to your past client or not past client, sending it out to your database, sending it out to any potential leads that would be interested in that property. Um, what else? I would say you can go live and create social, a video about yeah. the property and leverage social media, let the world see how hard you're working, make sure it's part of your email newsletter. Uh, part of it's just the residual benefits of showing people that you're working and you're busy. Um, I knew an agent in Texas who she used to, before COVID, and you can do it again now, she would slide broadcast her database. And she'd be like, hey, open house is tomorrow from one to four, carnitas are coming from such and such place, come eat my food and make my open house look busy. Yeah. And so she started training her database to show up to her open houses so it would look busy so that the buyers would feel a sense of urgency. She was training a database to work for her. And I found that to be really just awesome.
I love it. I love it. Again, please put your ch- questions in question and answer, not in the chat. Question and answer. It's the two little bubbles of question and answer. Um, One that says Q&A. Got, it does say Q&A. So get, uh, this person gets a lot of buyer leads from Instagram and Arabic TikTok. How would you oh, yeah, change I know her. your yeah. video? Yeah. How would you change your video messages to attract more sellers? Talk about seller problems. Talk about sell- what's happening for sellers. I, I, I mean, agree. I, I agree. So I think you got to talk about what sellers care about, which is how do we market a property today in the context of there being fewer buyers in the marketplace? Shift your subject matter to talk about what you would discuss with the seller, what matters to them. It's kind of what what I said when we were talking about expired listings, just shifting the subject matter. So Katie, I agree with you. It's that. Yeah. I mean, and, and we do, like I would say for my short form talking head type videos, I mean, I do probably about 50% is 50 to 60% seller focused stuff, right? So how we market, how we advertise how we do things like that. Um, Austin is leaning into demographic farming. Um, I know he's looking more into like downsizing seniors, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, I what, was going to ask which kind of demographic, Yeah. what, what, what would you do? Right. Uh, if you're targeting older homeowners that are in two story homes that have lived there potentially, I'll give you a tactic. Homes. I'll give you just one tactical idea that we've used in the past. Um, so we analyze what are some of the communities and where are the folks moving from that move into those communities? If it's a 55 and up community, for instance, and we target like farming, we target the neighborhoods that tend to feed them the most. Um, and we send them uh, pamphlets or PDFs or links to PDFs like, hey, here's our guide to new construction. Here's a guide to 55 and up communities. And we just start content marketing them through channels they're on. So we use a lot of postage for that kind of stuff to drive them to digital. I'm not saying they're not online. Um, that's one way. The other is you can buy list data. So you could buy the data off of a coal realty resource. You could buy the data off of property Remind. radar or whatever, Remind. And you could start just creating content that appeals to what information they may be looking for and targeting them on Facebook, for instance. So you have a lot of options there. I would I would definitely say Facebook would be the social platform. I would too. They're not on Instagram and TikTok like they would be on Instagram. Um, with limited financials, what yeah. would be some things to differently market a home to put it in the spotlight? I think every home deserves to be in the spotlight. Brad McCallum has his talk of like, you know, you're going to market that $300,000 house. Like it's a $400,000 house. You're going to market the $500,000 house. Like it's an $800,000 house. But what, uh, what are some examples that you would give as far as marketing a listing? Yeah. So I just did a blog on this where I went through 13 ways to market a listing and most of them were free. I'm going to find the link and drop it in the chat. ways to market your listing. I love it. Stand by. You can go to the next question. I'll just drop this in the chat. All right. Um, when we talk about email newsletters, do you recommend the newsletter to have a lot of different sections, pictures, videos, short and simple, button to your blog? I, I think while I, he's while he's I doing that, times. yeah, I think while he's doing that, it varies. I think that if you're doing a call to action or something like that, or the the Matt Curtis, you know, that that Jason was bringing up, like it should just be a hey, schedule a call and here's a button or here's a here's a link to yeah. do so. Um, what's happening a lot of times now when you're sending out the um, super fancy newsletters with all the stuff in them is that these email providers are getting smarter. And when they see all of that, sometimes it gets flagged or it doesn't go to their inbox. It goes to the VIP, uh, the promotions or all their tabs. Um, so you should have some plain text emails go through in your email sequences that are just, uh, hey, you know, are you interested in seeing any property? Schedule that here. Well, so like Matt, Matt does three emails a week. One is a plain text email every single week. So that's the sequence. Yeah. And this is Monday call to action. We actually have a video where I break down Matt's strategy on this week in marketing, which is our YouTube show on Tom's channel. Um, I would also say your welcome email matters a lot. So like when somebody joins your email list or they become a lead, you should be hitting them with an automatic email of what to expect. And in that email, they should be encouraged like, hey, add us to your contacts so we can circumvent spam filters in the future. So you get our content. Yeah. So I think just those types of things too help. I'm going to skip around a little bit. How do you connect clients? How do you get clients to connect with you on social? You ask them where they are, and then you pull up your thing to search for them and follow them, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And you just, you bank on reciprocity. If you comment on their posts, they're going to get a notification that you commented and they're going to feel an obligation or a reciprocity sense to reply. And it's going to create the connection. You got to be willing to initiate that relationship. Yeah. So. Um. If you have a limited budget, where would you put your internet ad spend? Who's asking? I'm looking in the uh, list. Sarah Maskalowski. Do you know where she is? I don't know where she is. All right. So I would, I would vary my answer depending upon the nature of your marketplace. Again, you're the general, 
and you know what the terrain is. Is it a metropolitan area? Is it a rural area? Is it a suburban area? That's going to have an impact on where I would put my marketing spend. Uh, answer for everybody is I would spend it on video. I would put my money into creating video content because I can do a lot with video content and there's no, there's nothing out there that's quite like video in terms of a know you, like you, trust you brand. So I would, I would spend my money on video. Okay. Does it make sense? It does. Sweet. It does. Good. Um, she's in Atlanta. Other people are in DC. I mean, I, like, yeah. So, so again, I would just hit. I would hit video because if you haven't really figured out how to make content, you're gonna always be limping along in your marketing game plan. Once you start having content, it opens you up to a new world of, well, I could use this content for ads. I could use this content for retargeting. I could use this content for emails and stuff like that. Get the content. Um, digging into the marketing pro courses, are they basic or more advanced? Um, is there any plan to do courses that are deeper and more advanced and more technical? Yes. Um, some of the people uh, yeah. are already doing it. So they- Yeah, marketing sure pro is a container. So Marketing Pro is a container product for me to keep adding more courses. So we will keep adding more courses. These first three are just the first three. Um, they are they are beginner to advanced. So I designed them to go from rookie to rock star. So I don't want to act like the social media courses don't go through some of the basics, nor do I want to act like they, they stay away from complicated subjects. Um, I dive into the algorithms in detail of TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. But I also talk about how to post a reel. And I actually do a lot of on-screen demonstrations. So I, I went through them with what I thought was a logical progression to take somebody who was, I, I imagined a couple of different use cases. I wanted to imagine a new agent. I also wanted to imagine a very experienced agent who was maybe struggling at the starting point. But I also wanted to imagine how do I get them to a point where they're like the Katie Day rock star on social. We did the same thing with email. I would say that the email course is probably the most technical. Um, just because there's a lot of technical nuance to email marketing and the Google business page course is the most tactical. If I had to give an answer to it. Um, I would, I would say, so Sarah made another comment. She's doing a lot of YouTube. I would say if you're doing YouTube already, YouTube in-stream ads would be the best course because you can get them pretty low per click and per view and per whatever. Right. And, um, I wouldn't start trying to do something else. If you're already on that platform, that'd be the platform I would go all in on in my opinion. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I the link to marketing pro is I'll drop it's, uh, it in Jason. It's uh, tomferry.com slash Jason dash M P as a marketing pro tomferry.com slash Jason dash M P. Are you putting it in the chat? I'm trying to tomferry.com slash backslash Jason M P dash M P. Yeah. Dash M P. Got to get fancy with it. Well, it's a UTM code. I love me. it. I love it. So they can know um, what I have a guy send there. All right. So yeah, Jason MP, Jason MP. Okay. Um, how can you get more sellers from YouTube? Uh, again, it always, boils, you get what you ask for. You get what you make content for. I believe sellers are inherently Googling who's the best realtor. So I would look like a Shannon Gillette and what she's doing. Um, I, and I think I look at a Brad McCallum and what he's doing. Brad attracts a ton of sellers because Brad makes really, really great listing videos. And then developers and sellers see what he's willing to do and able to do to promote a property and it attracts more business. If you focus on subject matters that are more buyer focused, you're gonna get more buyers. If you focus on subjects that are more seller focused, you're gonna get more sellers. Um, the other thing I would do is a paid strategy. And I have a video on my YouTube channel about this. Uh, David Caldwell is the one who did it first. It's simply doing a market update once a month for your area running an in-stream ad where you target that city and you target homeowners in it and you hit them every single month with market update videos, that will produce listing inquiries because you're the knowledge broker telling them about the marketplace. It just works. Um, where's a good place to find a virtual marketing person? Uh, uh, oof, that depends. Um, so I'm going to give answer, you a answer. callous she said, answer. She said local slash virtual. I would say locally post on wise hire or indeed or, LinkedIn. Um, or just on Facebook, LinkedIn. Those are all great places. To I, I've also been, you know, I've also been trying to find out what are my local hashtags on Instagram that I can find local based videographers. And that's been a pretty good source of looking at who's actually doing stuff on local hashtags. Yeah. Um, I would also prepare yourself to be doing training. Um, it is finding the people who can actually execute your vision. You are the general of the table. You are the one forming the battle plan. And so I think the sooner you can embrace that and make yourself a student of this, of sales and marketing, 
it is your business, the better and more effective you'll be as a leader of bringing people on to do those things because you have the means within you to tell them how you want things done versus just expecting some $15 an hour person to tell you how it works. It's probably not gonna work that way. It's kind of my calloused answer. Um, but there, are, if you look at it through that lens, like I'm gonna train somebody, well then it's like, well, Virtue Desk, uh, Support Realty, um, Go Squared Away, there's lots of resources out there for just virtual assistants in general, Fiverr, whatever. Yeah, all right, so we are at the top of the hour. There are a few other questions. Some of them are kind of technical and, you know, whatever. I would say maybe Jason will do an ask me anything on his Instagram uh, at some point over the next few weeks. And yeah. you can ask him these questions directly. Uh, yeah. Ask me anything then are beneficial because everyone gets the answers and, and benefits yeah. from his expertise. Absolutely. I'll do it. And I'll tag you so you can share the story when I do it. <laughs> Wonderful. I appreciate it. All right. Okay. Cool. Well, I cool. appreciate your time. Thank you so much for digging into this. I feel overwhelmed. I took, a, despite hearing this already, and talking about this, I took a bunch of notes, things that we need to to tighten up on for next year. So I appreciate you. For hey, that. nobody's going to do all of it. You're just not. That's not the point of today's presentation. What are your goals? What are the sources that achieve those goals? What are the channels that get those sources to achieve those goals? Nothing more, nothing less. It's your battle. And if you are looking for the slides, you go to jasonpantana.com slash battle plan. All lowercase. It won't work if it's upper. All lowercase. All right. I'm name. late for a call. I got to go. Bye. Bye. Thanks.